recording the event. Uh, a couple months ago, I, uh, we were looking for someone to fill a topic of audio plugins. A lot of us use those on a daily basis. And probably none of us know how to make one. So we kind of take that for granted on our daily lives. And we thought that the executive committee thought that would be a topic to talk about. And finally, uh, uh, DJ Walton hooked up with uh, Jeremy. So it's good to, uh, we had that synergy on that. So I just want to introduce uh, Jeremy Tuck. Thank you for having me. Uh, so I'm Jeremy Todd, the uh, CTO of Isotope, who, a local signal processing company. We make audio hardware and software, um, audio plugins, among the things that we make. And um, so I, as he said, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what goes on kind of behind the scenes uh, when you're making an audio plugin. And I wanted to start by getting a sense of uh, the audience. I'm curious, uh, how many people have used an audio plugin, for example, just show of hands? I assume almost everybody. How many people have built one before? Okay. Um, and I'm curious, how many people are like a, a hardware or software engineer by profession? So maybe half. And then how many people are musicians or composers uh, or audio related engineering field? Okay, that's the other half. Well, uh, as you probably know, uh, to make an audio plugin requires a lot of different skills. Um, and it kind of stunned me when I sat down to make this talk and I had to think through all the different um, skills and professions that go into it. It's a pretty long list. So I just wanted to go through that um, quickly to kind of set the stage for what I'm going to talk about. The obvious one that everybody sort of thinks of first is DSP because an audio plugin needs to do something and typically that means interacting with an audio signal uh, and processing it in some way. So enough said about that. There's also a fair amount of software engineering around that where you don't necessarily need any skills in DSP itself, but just creating um, an audio plugin that can run in real time on a modern computer in all the hosts that are out there on Mac and PC, for example, is quite a software engineering feat. And so that's a separate skill that's definitely required. As audio plugins get more complicated, product management is also a separate skill, just deciding what to put in them and what not to, uh, de basically determining the feature set. and at Isotope, we have product managers who work for us, but there's also what I think of as external product management. So we reach out a lot to our customers. We have a beta team. We have local uh, amateurs and professionals that we'll talk to and ask them for ideas about what they need to do their job better. UI design, again, these things are all coming into their own right. As um, the industry's matured, audio plug-in UIs have gotten more and more complicated, as I'm sure many of you have noticed. and so deciding uh, what goes into the UI has become sort of a separate skill. And there's a lot of artistic decisions that go into it and a lot of practical decisions because some people prefer the UI is very simple and they want them, they just want access to the DSP and other people want something more entertaining or more immersive. And that's a big trade-off that we struggle with constantly uh, at Isotope. Last but not least, uh, QA is something that um, is obviously important for something that's complicated there's a constant iteration where we're making things and testing them and then they're broken and they come back and we fix them and we go around and around. And I just wanted to point out that uh, I could give a talk about any one of these things for hours and hours. And so I don't know exactly what you all are interested in, which, which details. So please feel free to just uh, raise your hand and call out any questions that you have so that I can go into more detail. I'm going to try to uh, touch upon all these areas, though, as I cover um, a typical process that we use to make an audio plugin. And I also wanted to say that we have a company that's been doing this for a while, but there's also a large number of people out there who are doing all of these things themselves, and that's pretty impressive in and of itself. There's a lot of free audio plugins out there, and that means that there are people, usually it's just one person, who have all of these skills to some extent, and they do all these things basically in their free time. So that's sort of the, the freeware side of the industry. Um, and then there's a corporate side where Isotope sits along with our competition. And we just take all these roles and in our case, all of these things might be separate people or even multiple people. Okay. So I'm going to start by painting a basic timeline for what happens when you decide you want to build an audio plugin, at least how it's gone for us. Um, generally, we start with a concept, which is, you know, what's this thing? What's interesting about it? What's it going to do? And I'll get into these in more detail. I just want to lay out the timeline for you. Um, DSP algorithm, algorithm development usually happens pretty early. That's usually what the plugin is all about. And so we're going to start by coming up with 
maybe a prototype of a new algorithm or an example of how we can take an existing algorithm and make it better or faster. Um, and so we end up prototyping and then once we have a working prototype, we can start to involve other people in testing and giving us feedback. And eventually we hit beta, which I'll get into. That's a big milestone as far as involving people who aren't connected with the company to get their opinion about whether what we're doing is useful and whether they have any ideas that could improve it. Uh, UI design usually happens somewhere after the first beta, and that's when things get exciting because it starts to look like what it's going to look like when it's done. And so we'll have another beta milestone and then sprint to the finish. We've probably all been there. Any kind of project with a deadline uh, involves chaos and panic when the deadline approaches. Um, and things are no different at companies, no matter how big. You know, big public companies that we work with go through the same sort of thing and it gets stressful, but you get it done. And so I'll talk a little bit about that from our perspective. Okay, so starting with concept, it, it's hard to talk about this in general. I'm sure many of you have had ideas for new plugins that you wish you had or ways to do them better. So you have to start somewhere. The best I can do is give an example that'll take us through this talk. And so I'm gonna talk about Ozone 4, which is a product that we just released. And so it's kind of fresh on our minds and I can use that as our example. Uh, how many people are familiar with Ozone or Ozone 4 specifically? Okay. So for those of you who haven't heard of it, it's basically a mastering plugin. And the idea is even mastering is kind of hard to define precisely, but we're calling it, if you're working on a musical composition, after you're done mixing together, if you have separate tracks, after you're done mixing them together, everything you do to the audio before you say you're done is a very loose definition of mastering. And Ozone tries to bring together all of the processing that you'd need to do that uh, into one product. And that's one of the things that's sort of semi-unique about it. This is Ozone 3, which came out, um, it came out in 2003, so it's been on the market for a while. And the project that I'm going to describe for you is taking this and turning it into Ozone 4, which was a major rewrite and upgrade for us. And it took about, it's hard to count exactly, but maybe a year from start to finish to get that product done. So I'll give you a quick demo. Uh, I don't want to get, again, stop me if you have any questions or I can go into more detail. But we have basically six main processing modules here. And let me check. So there's an equalizer, there's a lot of metering, a lot of visual feedback, and there's a preset system. So you can click through and configure all the parameters immediately to find a good starting point. Um, you can get a really different character very easily by clicking through these presets because it has six processing modules uh, to work with. And so you're getting completely different settings every time. Forgive me for those of you who've seen Ozone before. Uh, but this is just a basic overview. So there's a crossover and three multiband modules, uh, harmonic exciting, dynamics, and a stereo imager. And then we have a reverb and a loudness maximizer. And I'll touch on a few of these uh, as they become relevant. So this is what we started with. And the goal was to make it better. So I just wanted to start, this might not be true every time you're making a plugin, but in this case, we had to really think what's gonna make this better? What's, what's worth it, what's not? What do people care about? And we had five years of customer support emails, probably a thousand, at least maybe 2,000 specific suggestions for things. So there was no shortage of ideas. As far as what it looked like over the years, this, is, this was our first product, our first commercial product in 2001. And so we went from this, which is Ozone 1, to Ozone 2 down here. It looks almost the same. We added a preset button. Uh, this looks really the same. All the so ozone two is in this corner and ozone three is up in the upper right. And from ozone two to three, we fo focused almost entirely on under the hood algorithmic improvements. For ozone four, we decided to offer people a little bit of everything. And so we redesigned the user interface. Uh, it looks, it's hard to see, I'll show you a bigger one in a minute. But it looks cooler, it looks sharper. And under the hood, there are some major DSP improvements and some minor ones. And one of the things I wanted to explain is kind of from our perspective, what's easy and what's hard because there's a lot of things that I think you might take for granted if you open up an audio plugin and start using it. And there's a lot of work that goes on to make it work the way it does. So let me give you a few examples. Um, so without getting too technical, we have loudness maximizer and ozone. 
And for those of you who don't know, a loudest maximizer is basically a compressor, but it's configured to work on an overall mix, and it typically has a brick wall constraint. And so you're going to set a threshold, and the rule is that it cannot output samples that exceed that threshold under any conditions. And the idea is that samples that exceed that threshold are probably going to clip because loudness maximizing happens pretty late in the processing chain, typically when you're mastering. And one example of a DSP algorithm improvement, which is the sort of thing you might expect from a company like Isotope, is we said, okay, how can we take a loudness maximizer and do something new that's never been done before? So uh, Alexi Lukin is our lead DSP engineer for, uh, he, he came up with the original loudest maximizer in Ozone 3, and he figured out a way to use uh, transients as an input to the algorithm. So if you have a transient event, like a, a percussive hit, as compared to a non-transient event, which is something like a sustained portion of a vocal, you want to do different things in order to get the most perceived volume out of those two events, because our ear processes them in very different ways. And so he spent a, you know, several months at least figuring out how to detect transients in this context and then use it to alter the behavior of the loudness maximizer on the fly. And so that's an example which is probably along the lines of what people expect. We kind of, it was one guy who went in and focused on a problem and came up with a new control and a new way of behaving that offered tangibly better results and we put that into Ozone 4. Compared with that, there's another example which I want to talk about, which is mid-side processing. Um, how many people are familiar with mid-side in a processing context? Okay, good. So, forgive my ugly diagram. This is uh, just the basics of it. If you have, for example, a mid-side equalizer, uh, so on the left here I have a stereo EQ, which you can think of as two separate EQs, and they treat the left and the right channel completely separately. So in the simplest case, it's just a filter, and it's the same filter applied to left and right. If you convert to a mid-side representation, you're basically summing the left and right channels to get the mid-channel, and you're subtracting them to get the side channel. And the mid-channel can be thought of as the things that are towards the center of the sound stage, and the side channel is things that are towards the edges. And the advantage of this is once you have a mid-side representation, then you can treat the mid and side differently. And I can give you an example. I don't know how audible it will be in here, but here's Ozone 4. Okay. So maybe on this we can get something. No, it's too mono. All right, hold on. Okay. Let me come back here. So if we switch this EQ from stereo to a mid-side mode, you're going to see two different curves representing the frequency response. So uh, the orange color is the mid-channel, and the cyan color is what we're doing to the side channel. And you can link them together or treat them independently. And the easiest way to understand a mid-side EQ is if you take the side channel and make it louder, then you're going to perceive those frequencies as being wider apart. And so this gives you a way to do frequency-dependent stereo widening instead of a simple stereo widener, which is just applied broadband to the entire audio signal. And if I open that, let's see. Okay. So if I do this, again, I have no idea how audible, I'm not exactly in the sweet spot here, but you should be hearing the content around where this peak is, which happens to be around two kilohertz, getting wider, while the content that's outside of those frequencies stays as it is. And I'll try to make it pretty extreme. So you should hear the soundstage collapse when I bypass the EQ and then widen up when I activate it. And I bring up this example because that is a useful tool to have if you're mastering. At least some people think so. You know, Ozone's all about offering you options. And so some mastering engineers embrace this, and some say this is terrible and you should do that with panning in the mixing stage. Um, not the topic for this talk, but <laughs> the point is you can do it with Ozone 4. And you would think, oh, okay, that's easy. You know, that's really just a plus and a minus. And you're right, I, it pretty much is in the code 
for ozone, just a plus and a minus. There's no magic. But everything gets complicated when you try to actually sell something, when you try to actually release something for other people to use and you're not just making it for yourself. And this is the sort of thing we struggle with constantly because especially in the early days, you know, I would say, oh, midside, okay, no problem. That's, that's four hours and we can add that and we're all set. And then I realized, wait, that's not four hours. By the time you get through all the complexities, it, it could be a month, literally. The most obvious thing is that the UI needed to be redesigned and rethought because now you have twice as many parameters. And so the, the UI complexities uh, might be apparent, but even under the hood, there are things that can get pretty complicated. And I just want to give you one example of the sort of thing that you, you, know, you might not have thought of as a user of a plugin like Ozone. So I need to bring up system delay, which is probably something most people are familiar with, but just to summarize it quickly, if you're building a plugin or anything that's processing audio, uh, there's two reasons I know of that you would need to introduce system delay. And one is that if you're making something like a compressor and it needs look ahead, so you're looking at the audio as it comes in. If you're the compressor and you're looking at audio as it's fed to you, if there's a peak coming a few milliseconds in the future, you might want to know about that so that you can start bringing the gain down early so that by the time the peak gets there, you're already compressing it. And the only way to do that in an audio plugin or any like real physical system is to, uh, it, the only way to do it in a system where audio is streaming through it instead of an offline context where you're allowed to process an entire file, for example, is to introduce system delay. So you need to wait and say, okay, I need at least two milliseconds of audio before I can output anything. And this works fine, but it means that your output has two milliseconds of silence uh, before the real audio comes. And so if you're using ozone on one track in a multi-track project, for example, the track with ozone on it is going to slip by two milliseconds with respect to the others, and you get phasing problems and all sorts of undesirable things. So, okay, how do we deal with this? Well, from, if you're building an audio plugin, you simply need to report it to the host and let them deal with it. And what they do is they'll delay all the other tracks by two milliseconds so that everything's in sync. And that's fine in theory. But <laughs> in reality, it gets very complicated because first of all, delay compensation is, it doesn't work reliably in every host and ozone is in the unfortunate position of having a variable system delay. And so we need to make sure that we report it correctly at all times to the host. The other reason why you might need system delay is if you're working, for example, in the frequency domain and you need to take a Fourier transform of, let's say, 1,024 samples, which is difficult. Again, if you're the plug-in and you're getting audio, you can't do anything until you've received 1,024 samples. So you're going to output 1,023 samples of silence while you're waiting, uh, unless you have a guarantee that you're going to get blocks of 1,024, uh, which you don't if you're making a plug-in. You have hardly any guarantees because you have to work in everybody's DAW on every platform, and it's extremely complicated to pull that off. So I want to show you an example of that, uh, an example of how we attack that problem at Isotope. The best we can do is report our system delay, and so we actually made this tool, which is a standalone version of Ozone that we haven't released to the public, but the advantage of having a standalone version of Ozone is that we can add all sorts of crazy internal testing tools. And so we have the system delay panel that logs system delay related events. And so if we switch our EQ from analog to digital mode, digital mode is using buffering that requires fixed block sizes. And so it's going to incur latency, in this case, 1,534 samples. And when I switch between analog and digital, you can see that we're reporting that uh, to the host and it's all logged here. So this is important because now we can give this tool to the QA guys and have them check, you know, in theory, every permutation of Ozone's parameters and make sure that the system delay is always correctly reported. So system delay is another one of those things. You, you might not think about it too much, but it causes all sorts of problems. To get back to the example here, mid-side is fine, but imagine that this EQ is linear phase, which means it's imposing a delay and you're bypassing processing on the mid-channel, but not the side, which is a useful thing to be able to do if you have some interesting EQ curve and you want to hear what it sounds like treating just the mid portion of the sound stage. You have a little bypass checkbox here, but <coughs> if you're bypassing, let's say, this top EQ, which is the mid-EQ, and not the bottom EQ, 
then the top EQ is going to have no system delay because it's not there. And the bottom EQ is going to have 1,534 samples, for example. And they're out of sync, which again is no good because you're going to get phasing artifacts when they're mixed back together here at the mid-side decode step when you're going back to stereo. And we can't report that to the host because this is all happening inside ozone. Uh, we're, not, we're not presenting these samples here to the host. They're, they're part of ozone's internal signal chain. So we had to add our own delay compensation to make sure that if this is bypassed, we replace it with the delay line, which is simulating the delay that would be there if it weren't bypassed. And then on top of that, if you hit bypass and the delay is changing or the delay line isn't, um, is flushed at the wrong time, you're going to get a click, which is annoying to users. And so then you have to think about adding crossfading. And I could go on forever with the complexities all from something that DSP-wise, you know, all you'd learn in school if you're studying DSP is that mid-side is plus and minus, and that's that. And so I just wanted to point out some of the details that go into actually pulling something off in a commercial plugin that might not be obvious from the user's perspective. Okay. So there's other big DSP-related things. We made a new harmonic exciter model, which again is closer to what you might expect. We looked at a way to uh, basically distort a signal such that we're adding only even, har we're introducing even harmonics, which gives it a warmer sound. Uh, so that was another fairly straightforward thing that we tackled for Ozone 4. And there are some smaller things that I've touched on already, better bypass transitions. In general, this is very difficult if you're bypassing something, especially if you're hitting this button and bypassing all of Ozone, then uh, you're going to get, generally speaking, you're going to get a click. And so we tried very hard to add crossfades internally to make sure that we try to minimize clicking so that ozone isn't making clicking and popping sounds when you're interacting with its bypass button. And I, I don't, has anyone noticed that problem with plugins before when toggling bypass? It's, uh, it, it depends on the plugin, but it's certainly even some very high-end ones. In some cases, it's very difficult to pull off clean bypass transitions. So we struggle with that a lot and try to work on it as best we can. Uh, let's see, another example, we added a mix control in our dynamics module. This is, again, pretty straightforward. Uh, this is basically a wet-dry mix. So in this case, it really was pretty much as simple as it sounds. We have access to the wet signal. We have access to the dry signal. As long as delay compensation is correct and they're, they're in phase, then it's pretty much just adding gain and summing them together. So there are some things that were straightforward, but certainly not everything. And then... Uh, the other thing I want to touch upon without getting too technical is some of the invisible things that are, are completely not apparent to a user. Uh, Lock-free processing is one example, and has anyone heard of that? I know a couple guys in the audience have because <laughs> they work with me on it all the time. But okay, it's, uh, the idea is if you have a, an audio plugin, I just want to present some of the really under the hood technical challenges that we struggle with. If you have an audio plugin, uh, Typically, you've got audio running through it on one thread, and you have UI interactions on a separate thread. And those things are happening simultaneously. So for example, if you have a, a dual core machine, which almost everyone has probably at this point, then those things really are happening simultaneously. One might be happening on each core. And we have to worry a lot about how they communicate with each other. And the way you learn, at least the way I learned in school, is that, well, you just you have these things called locks. And so if the DSP is doing something and the user clicks a button and needs to talk to the DSP to change a parameter, you hold a lock and tell the UI to wait. And vice versa, if the UI is doing something uh, and the DSP needs to, and the DSP needs to process, then it's gonna try to hold the lock and it will wait. And this works pretty well if you have enormous buffer sizes. So like in the old days, in the uh, you know, early 2001, 2002, when low latency wasn't really possible uh, and everybody's hardware buffer sizes were something like 4,096 samples, then this worked pretty well because the computer was pretty fast with respect to the, the size of the buffers that were flowing around. But these days, everything is really low latency and you can get, you can set things up so that the buffers are less than a millisecond. And it's nice, it makes the meters run really fast and the system's really responsive, but it means that this notion of holding a lock is no good because if, you, if it's time to process audio and you say, I'm sorry, you can't because uh, you know, I'm drawing something right now and you can't access that, then you get a pop or you get a dropout, which is a big scary message box in your DAW saying, hey, I'm sorry, you just lost sync with your sound card. And if you happen to be recording, then that's too bad. And so that design was really not 
viable moving forward. And so one of the things we struggled with was completely redesigning that so that the two threads can talk to each other without ever waiting. And another related thing is the notion of buffer sizes, which I mentioned. So I, I don't know how often you guys do this. If you have performance problems in general, you probably go and fiddle with the buffer size in your DAW if you're working with plugins. And I can give you some in insight as to why. Uh, we made, again, our little standalone ozone, which we never released, let us make tools like this. So if you have something like our analog equalizer and you hit this button, it's actually running audio through the equalizer at various buffer sizes and figuring out how efficient it is. And I don't know if you can read these numbers, but they're dropping drastically as the buffer size gets bigger. So the reason for that is there are some things that have to happen every buffer. And if you have really small buffers, they're happening a lot. And if you have really big buffers, they're not happening very often at all. And uh, there's other technical reasons, but in general, this is sort of proof that, yeah, you really should increase your buffer size if you're having performance problems because simply there's less work for the plugin to do if you do that. And so we have tools like this that we use to keep our eye on how buffer size dependent our processing is. And we struggle with that all the time too because we don't like having to ask our customers to increase their buffer sizes if they don't want to. And that's another one of those things that you just can't solve if you're building audio plugins. You, all you can do is be aware of it and you know, do your best given all the other trade-offs that you're struggling with. Okay, so that's some of the stuff that goes into the DSP side of an audio plugin. Eventually, we'll get that worked out to the point where we want to get people's feedback and we might release something like this. There. So this is, you've probably seen this in a lot of DAWs, it's just showing you the parameters that the plugin has and it's, you know, you don't have to look at the plugin's pretty UI if you don't want to. And uh, this is the sort of thing that we might start with so that if, if we haven't had time to hook up the UI yet, we'll give people something like this and say, okay, you can at least play with the new processing algorithms using this, using this view. And this is pretty useful if, if we don't have time to set up the UI side of things. And this usually means we're going to beta, which is the first major milestone. So we put together a beta team, which is customers who ask if they could join, uh, maybe local professionals who we can sit down with if we need to. And this is the first time that anyone outside of the company gets their hands on the plugin. And quite honestly, usually it's a complete mess at first because the plugin's half done and everybody's got their own idea, especially if they're professionals. They want to try to take whatever we're doing and make it into something that's perfect for them, for their workflow. And so we just are completely overwhelmed with feedback and we have to learn how to say no a lot and just keep track of suggestions as best we can. So typically we end up trying to focus the beta team on specific areas and get feedback like, okay, this new loudness maximizer, does it sound good or not? You know, is it, is it viable for you? So the other side of things that I want to hit upon is the UI design. And one of the things we tried for with Ozone is this idea of like a new car model is how I described it. So here's the old Ozone 3 and we wanted something that was familiar, but the sort of artistic conceptual feedback that we gave our designer, or the, the goal we gave him was to come up with something that looks cooler and new and desirable for people who have this one without looking totally alien. And I think car designers pull this off pretty well if you look at the models of cars as they evolve. So this was our attempt at it. And, sorry, it's a little dark. So this is what, this is the form that our UI takes at first. It's our designer completely mocks it up in Photoshop. And it's, it's usually Photoshop for almost everything that we do. Although sometimes there's like a 3D Studio Max that's, you have some sort of 3D model that gets rendered down and imported into Photoshop. And it's all layered so you can do things like hide the, the physical part of the interface and just look at, just look at the flat parts. And so then work begins iterating on this design. And usually at first we're concerned about the overall look and not the details. And one of the first things that we do is send this out to the beta team. And then that's another separate challenge for us because this is pretty subjective. And 
we'll send this out and some people will say that they don't like green and they prefer yellow and the other half will say they don't like yellow and they want red. And it's literally impossible to make everyone happy with something subjective. And so we struggle with that quite a bit. There's also the obvious trade-off where, you know, is this too fluffy? Like there's a, there's all this space over here that's not really functional, it's just a bevel. It's a, it's a photorealistic, um, you know, this, this green real estate is sort of wasted from some people's point of view. And so we struggle with that as well. And sometimes our designer will do something gorgeous and, you know, it, it looks really stunning, but there's not enough, there's too much wasted screen real estate, which is precious if you've ever worked with a large project and you've got, you know, 20 or 30 plugins open at once, then obviously you want to keep them small. And so that's another trade-off that we struggle with. And we put it out to our beta team, which might have 75 people on it. And then we just kind of add up all the responses and try to figure out what's in general going to make people happy. But it's not easy to manage that trade-off. Uh, one of the more interesting things that we do at this phase is try to figure out how we can take advantage of software. So when all this started, which is you know before I was born, honestly, uh, there were hardware processors for everything. You know, computers weren't viable for real-time audio, and so there's this certain expectation in the industry that things will look and feel that way. If you call something an equalizer, a lot of people who are used to hardware equalizers have an expectation for that, and that's good. Uh, but it, it also leaves room for improvement. And so something that happened, for example, with equalizers is they started out, uh, the first software equalizers, as far as I know, looked very much like hardware equalizers. They had knobs. And maybe the thing you can do in software that you can't do in hardware is that you could type in the value that you wanted instead of dialing it up with the knob. And that's an improvement, but there certainly was a long way to go beyond that. And so we weren't the first to do this, but you know some of the, the cooler equalizers to come out that were completely foreign from hardware ones look like this instead. And you can find hardware equalizers now that will give you this information, but uh, I'm pretty sure they're quite expensive and I, I believe it happened in software first because it's so much cheaper if you have a computer with a graphics card and a mouse and you can design this sort of immersive interface. So this equalizer, which you, you've probably all seen equalizers like this at this point, they're pretty common. It's a much more graphical way of working with what's basically a filter. So you've got your EQ bands, and they all contribute to this overall bright red frequency response. And if you select a band here, then you can see in dark red the contribution that that individual band is making. And to make people happy, uh, it's important to give them a way to go back to the, the older way of interacting with it. And this isn't great. This is the older one. I'll show you the newer one in a second. Uh, that we came up with. But the basic idea is that this is something that really isn't practical in hardware. And it's, it's quite doable in software. And so we're always looking for things like that where you can take a, maybe it's an algorithm that's been around for a while or a general concept, and we're looking for a way to do it better or more interesting in software. So one of the things that we did that we also thought was useful is we put a spectrum analyzer underneath the equalizer so that as you're working with audio, you can see the effect that your tweaks have. So if you bring, you know, if you're, if you're cutting aggressively, you're going to see that in the spectrum analyzer. And again, that's something you can have separate devices in hardware, but to have them overlaid like that, sharing a frequency axis, can be quite useful. And so these are the sort of things we're fixated on when we're designing. We can't always do it, but I think those are the more fun things. Also, metering can get a lot more uh, elaborate in software. So you can have things like this, which plot the... Uh, left-right phase information for audio for, uh, for each sample so that you can see a mono signal would be a vertical line and the opposite of that where left and right are out of phase 180 degrees would be a horizontal line. And so you can start to gauge the overall shape of your mix which correlates to the sound stage that you're hearing. And this is another example where we try hard to do things that aren't possible in hardware because we might as well take advantage of the platform that we're designing for. So when we get through that and the UI starts to stabilize, and it looks something like what we might end up releasing, then we'll go back to the beta team and ask them to really use it. So this is where we say, okay guys, you know, if you're a professional mastering engineer, try it on some client's projects. Sit down with them in front of it. And this is a little scary because if we have bugs uh, where it's crashing, you know, that's starting to cost people money and it can get frustrating for them. But this is invaluable because we're, inevitably we get feedback 
when someone actually tries to use something in the real world uh, that we wouldn't get earlier when we're just imagining it being used in that context. So at this point in the time frame, uh, the feature set is usually nearly frozen and we're worried more about small improvements rather than large new features and we're fixing bugs constantly yeah, as they come in. We have to be disciplined at this point in order to actually release and keep everyone sane. We have to table things for the future. So if there are good ideas, which there often are this late in the game, oftentimes we end up saying, okay, let's wait for Ozone 4.01 or 4.02, or let's wait for Ozone 5. And this is where, as you might imagine, QA gets pretty busy because as you know, there's probably uh, 30 or 40 like commercial plugin hosts out there and we try to test on all of them, which is just to open up the plugin in 40 hosts could take you three hours. Uh, just tracking down all of them and getting the latest versions is almost a full-time job. And so plugins are great for you guys because you can use them everywhere, and plugins are quite a challenge engineering-wise because we have to test them and support them everywhere. And if there's bugs in a host, then it looks like it's our fault and we have to contact you know, Steinberg right away. And conversely, if there's bugs in a plugin, it might look like it's Steinberg's fault, and so they'll contact us and say, hey, you need to fix this. And that's a constant battle that starts right around now where QA is going to be opening up different hosts every day or different hosts every hour and making sure that our compatibility is there. So that's another big effort that goes on behind the scenes to make sure that by the time we ship, no matter what host you're using, Mac, PC, you know, no matter what sound card you have, you're going to get a good, like, solid experience using our products. So... To give you a quick example of that, auto broadcast is something that tends to break a lot. I can explain what that is. I don't know how, uh, does anybody typically automate plugin parameters in a DAW? Is that a, okay, it's, it's pretty useful for some things, probably not for everything, but we can't really make that decision. And so the list of automated, automatable parameters for ozone is 200 or 300, do you? It's, it's daunting. And, um, we need to make sure that if you're automating a parameter and let's say you have it in touch mode, then the host needs to know when you're touching a parameter so that it can start recording automation changes. So for something like this, it's okay. Uh, if you have a slider, then you can say, okay, every time you, know, you, you put mouse down on a fader, then you, we need to tell the host you've grabbed the fader. And then every time you move the mouse, we need to tell the host that you've moved it. And so this is just a tool we made to log those changes so that it can be tested. If you have something like this EQ interface, it gets more complicated. Like this is mid-side mode and now they're linked. So I just actually grabbed three, I just actually grabbed three or two or three parameters simultaneously by grabbing this node. And every time I move it, I'm changing four parameters at once, mid and side, frequency and gain. And so we need to get all that right just on the off chance that someone happens to open up the mid-side EQ and turn on automation for node five. We need to make sure that it behaves correctly, which is a lot of work. Um, kind of behind the scenes that goes on. And so again, the way we approach it is to make tools like this so that it can be, so that all the combinations of ways to interact with parameters can be tested. And that carries us to kind of the crazy time approaching release date. Again, as we all know, things, no matter how hard you try to make sure that it's going to be a smooth release, there's always things that come up. And if there's nothing that comes up, then we tend to get more ambitious and say, hey, let's add these features that we thought we didn't have time for. And so it gets a little stressful, but we try to keep it under control. And uh, we use a tool called Bugzilla internally, which is just a list of bugs that you can sort and prioritize. And that's the center of our process, at least at the moment. And so it, towards the end, it's all about deciding what needs to be fixed and what can wait, which is a process we call triage. Um, kind of referring to hospitals is the same sort of thing. Like you have a patient come in and you have to decide if it's important enough to merit your attention because you've only got a week or two weeks left to go. And inevitably there are bugs that spill over to future releases. And so juggling that is sort of an art in and of itself. And that's project management side of things, which again could be a whole separate profession. And in Ozone 4, we did it this way. So this information can be docked and is permanently visible. And so these, this numeric view doesn't get in your way, which seems like a little thing, but for someone who uses our equalizer a lot, it's, it's very important. And so this came up, I forget, it was very close. It, we had like a day to do it. And it was the sort of thing that caused us to panic and scramble, but it was worth it because it made it into the product. And so that's always a judgment call, deciding what's worth it or not. And otherwise, it's a sprint for the finish. 
and you know it gets a little crazy towards the end but we always make it one way or another and then it's what you might imagine these days it's put it live on your website and cross your fingers and see what happens uh, we'll also start burning a CD depending on whether it's coming out simultaneously in stores and on the web we might it's a little anticlimactic in that case because we send it off to go onto a CD and be put in a box and nobody gets to see it even though we're done and we can't touch it anymore. But if it's just a web release, then it's literally minutes after we're done, uh, we can put it up and people can start grabbing it. These days, forums are pretty important because they're very public and Google picks them up if you search for our products. And so we're always watching the forums closely after our, an initial release just to see what people's impressions are. And they can be good or bad. You know, sometimes we'll jump in and defend ourselves. Uh, but it's always, it's great because you get immediate feedback from people who can start threads and then everyone chimes in. And so you can, real, you can really get a sense for whether people like your audio plugin right away by keeping your eye on forums. And then we'll plan updates. There's always updates. That's the nice thing about software is that you can do updates and people accept that. And it is a bit annoying, but the fact that all you have to do is go to a website and download a new installer you know, it takes a few minutes and you can get dozens or hundreds of extra engineering hours. It's really invaluable from our perspective because it lets us continue to improve things uh, after release, which is pretty important. And that's it, A to Z, building an audio plugin. So I was hoping to take any questions, especially if I could go into more detail about which aspects of that were interesting. I, I tried to touch on all the different areas that go in from our perspective to building a plugin, but I'm not sure exactly uh, which areas are most interesting to you guys? Yeah. I have two quick questions. One is uh, on the EQ, um, is there an advantage or a difference between using a linked mid side or just a regular EQ? And then the other one is if you want to use um, ozone just in a track, can you set it to a fixed latency so you can tell your your you know your DAW to, to just move it by whatever millisecond you need? So both good questions. The, uh, so the EQ, if it's in mid-side mode and it's linked, and the mid and side curves are exactly the same, then technically speaking, it's a linear system, which means the answer is it is exactly the same as having it in stereo mode. So the only reason to use mid-side would be if you want a difference between your mid and side curves. And regarding system delay, it's a good idea. I think we, we have something called freeze which is related, but it's not quite the same. And that's an idea that actually came up pretty late as far as having a budget for, you could say, okay, I want the system delay always to be 1,000 samples or something like that. The problem is that the maximum system delay for ozone is enormous if you put everything in its you know, most greedy mode as far as system delay goes. And so we have to make that a setting and then decide what to do. If, if you say the limit is 2,000 and then you go over, you're gonna be in trouble. So we didn't figure out a really good way to pull it off, but I think in future releases we'll try, because that would be, I agree, That's a pretty nice. I was hoping that hosts would actually just start handling changing system delay, because that's really the best. But many of them don't, unfortunately. Think about what you have to do to do it. Uh, on the host side? Yeah. Well, on transport changes would be sufficient. I think from a user's point of view, you know, if you have to stop and restart it to get it to sync up, it's okay. And there are many that do that. I think Digital Performer does, and Maybe Pro Tools is rumored to do it, but it's a little flaky, I think. So, yeah, but I agree. It's a lot easier if, if system delay is fixed from a host perspective. That's certainly true. Yeah. Can you say that again? It's very crucial. Oh, yeah. Right. It used to be it used to be almost purely sound quality because we started in 2001 when we were still like, if you've heard of Moore's Law, like computers were still getting twice as fast every year. And I don't know if you noticed, that's, those days are gone. Now we're getting twice as many cores, which is definitely not the same thing. And so uh, to answer your question, these days we really have to keep our eye on performance because back in 2001, actually uh, Ozone 1 barely ran in real time on current computers and then a year later it was fine. And these days we can't do that. We have to keep our eye on performance, so it's more of a 50-50 split. Because having more cores means you can do more things in parallel, but that's not easy. If you're processing audio, uh, 
or programming in general, it's a very, you, you think about it sort of one thing at a time and having lots and lots of basically little mini computers at your disposal doesn't really help. It, sometimes it does, but more often than not, it doesn't. And so we don't have this wonderful thing where computers are getting exponentially faster anymore. And I think that's actually, that's really gonna change the way software is developed moving forward. It's gonna be interesting to see. Uh, people will have to start taking performance a lot more seriously, I think. And that works. Hosts can do it. So they can run separate plugins on separate cores if they're on separate tracks. Right, but in some cases, if you have a dependency, then it gets complicated. So it's, it's certainly not, it's nowhere near as good as just saying, hey, let's double the clock speed on the processor every year. You know, we'll always take that if we have the option. The sound quality? Yeah. That's a great question too. Uh, it gets hard. Not everyone who works at Isotope can hear the subtle differences in algorithms. Usually it's the DSP algorithm designer first and foremost, and then our QA guys tend to have really good ears, and so they're generally grabbing builds every morning and chomping on it and then giving feedback. And the last line of defense there is the beta team, who typically are uh, using things in a real world context and so they'll have actual brand new projects and the, they'll give us feedback usually on a daily basis too. Yeah. Um, you said that you're going to be able to use the faster but more specialized graphics processor. Do you still work with that? Uh, there was a guy who around here, I forget his name now. Does anybody know? Uh, James Can, I think. Does anyone know him? No? Someone tried to do that in the audio industry with a reverb, which is a good choice because that's um, Convolution reverb can be incredibly computationally intensive and graphics cards are basically designed for that sort of task. And I heard he had prototypes up and running but I never saw anything ship. So I don't know, I know it got easier. Like I think, is it Nvidia? Someone has a toolkit that can let you use that. Do, am I understanding you correctly? Using graphics cards for audio processing? Okay. Yeah, as far as I know, no one's done it yet. Uh, I saw a couple of like shareware-ish things come out and so I don't know if that's the future. It's it's the same problem I mentioned earlier. Graphics cards aren't that fast. It's just that they can do a ton of things in parallel. And depending on what kind of DSP you're writing, it's not always easy to take advantage of that. Well, unfortunately enough, it's most of it's going to be things that are 16 bits in parallel. Yeah, and the resolution isn't the same as what you'd want. It's definitely not designed for audio. So it's really cool that someone managed to use it at all. And I think there are some working examples that you can download. but. The other thing is that graphics card drivers are, are a mess, at least in my experience. We, we tried using graphics cards for graphics, actually, at Isotope. Um, <laughs> and we gave up, uh, honestly. We, used, we, <laughs> we had OpenGL support, and we thought, hey, this is great. Look at all this stuff we're doing. Like that, This EQ curve is anti-aliased, and you know, there's some math. And your processor is doing that when it could be processing audio. And look at, you bring up the option screen, and that's, it's transparent, so there's alpha blending. You can see what's going on behind it. Graphics cards are designed for that, but the experience was so different from machine to machine, and there were so many bugs that we ended up running into when we tried to use the accelerated facilities on the graphics cards that we gave up and basically bypass all of it um, just because we can't ship products that aren't stable you know, to so many users. It's, it's not viable. So that's my take on graphics cards. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. We actually do. Uh, you can turn down the frame rate. So now it's going to go chunk, 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 which is sort of ugly. But uh, more importantly, I mentioned threads before where you have like the audio thread going and the UI thread going. And on both Windows and OS X, there's always a, an idea of priority. And so the audio thread is always, always higher priority than the UI thread. So basically, if you need more cycles to process audio, you'll always get it. And the UI will just slow down. So if you ever, you've probably seen this, if you overload your machine, the first thing that happens is the mouse gets chunky and everything slows down. And that's great because in theory, you'd, I, I assume you'd rather have that than to get more dropouts. And so in essence, the OS kind of forces you into an ugly mode when it needs to, which is nice. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah, from an engineering perspective, no doubt. I mean, that's just good engineering no matter what you're doing, is reuse what you can. And so we've learned how to do what we do, and we have tools like this thing I've been showing uh, everybody. And that will certainly apply to everything we do. Some of the DSP, like if we need a filter bank for what we're doing, then we're going to pull a filter bank we've probably designed before. And so it might be, it's hard to say, but maybe 30% of the DSP might be components that we're reusing, and 70% might be new. Obviously, it depends. And so that's true. Usually, the, the challenge for something new is coming up with some angle, especially if you're trying to sell it. And it's not just like, hey, let's make an X because I want to try it and it's fun. You know, if we have to make a profit on it or at least worry about that side of things, then can we do it better or can we at least do it as well as everyone else? And can we do it fast enough that it'll make sense? Sure, sure. Yeah. Yep. Right. And more generally applicable. Yeah. yeah, that's. I guess the isotope shtick um, has always been more bigger task-oriented plugins. We are starting to work on some more specialized things. It's harder to it's harder to be innovative there because there are so many. If you want an equalizer, you know, there's got to be at least 250 that you could choose from. And so. We've always been more excited about things that we have an, a real angle on that are somehow new and interesting. But with that said, we are looking at making more focused plugins because I think many of our users uh, would benefit from that, no doubt. You do everything C++ and you have one code base for both uh, Mac and uh, Windows? We do. It's all C++. Uh, we do have one code base, thank goodness. Uh, <laughs> we, we added Mac in 2003. And the first thing we did was say, okay, let's start from scratch and make sure that when we're even UI code, which has the potential, DSP tends to be the same no matter what platform because Windows and OS X don't give you anything to help you. No, they don't give you much to help you. They might give you a Fourier transform or something. But UI, you might be tempted by either platform to use the nice, pretty blue Mac buttons, you know, instead of making your own button. But if you do that, it's going to look different on the two platforms, and you're going to have twice as much code to write. So instead, we took the trouble of implementing things like this list box, you know, which isn't a standard OS X list box, which Apple doesn't like, by the way, but we did it. And it's not a standard Windows list box, which Microsoft doesn't care about, but we did it anyway. <laughs> and that's the difference in the platform. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> But the nice thing is that it's one code base. And that's very important, I think, just for efficiency. And also for testing, we have more confidence in things, even if we haven't tested them to the same extent. Yeah, can you comment on whether uh, which hosts are particularly easy for you to work with? And particularly no, that's not nice. That? <laughs> <laughs> we, we love them all equally. <laughs> <laughs> what are your ideas? <laughs> yeah, sure. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, we're always tempted to do more. It, it's actually not much. Things like uh, this guy are great because I hit this button and it's actually, we used to do this manually. We used to set the buffer size to something and measure the performance and set it again. So specific tasks, I think we've automated. But as far as compatibility, it's hard. Like to open something in a different, in each host requires a different thing that you click on. And that changes all the time anyway with when they're updating. So in general, it's really just um, a lot of manpower. Of regression, you know, you have a long, a long run of this tool that is going to be against another run. We've done a little bit of regression. If we're nervous about a change, then we'll regress against the known good version. But in general, we don't. Um, I do know there are some larger public companies that have an impressive level of that. And we honestly, we haven't gone there yet where every night it'll regress and in the morning you get an email from the master robot thing that says, hey, you know, just so you know, you changed your equalizer and it's three decibels different now. You know, have a nice day. So. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's cool. We just, we haven't done it yet. We have a really solid, like really great QA department who are just, take a lot of pride in this and they don't What's mind. What's the ratio of like QA engineers with the developers? That's a good question too. Uh, it depends. Usually we'll start with like one or two developers early on and then Ozone 4 had like five or six coders on it at the end just to hit the release date. And QA is usually about two people. So the ratios, maybe it's, uh, well in the beginning there's, we don't want to 
like burden them with a half broken thing. So it's just pure development until we hit a certain milestone. And then it tends to be about 50 50. And then towards the end, we have like a bug war where they'll submit bugs and we'll fix them. And we always lose the bug war. So we bring in more manpower on the development side. And then we usually stagger off to release like that. Yeah. Yeah, why is it that uh, you use Fourier now with this, and I see this with many other plugins, that the piece of NFST versus digital reverse filter, where your, your filters are inherently live, where everything's going to probably match much more closely to what uh, you know, people are seeing, probably it's going to match more closely to what you're actually hearing. Wow, okay, I'm not an expert in, in digital recursive filters, uh, but I believe that you can simulate that with a large enough Fourier transform, you can no, group no, bands. No, Well, it's not, I think it's not identical, but you're talking about like a, a logarithm. You're saying a Fourier transform has linearly spaced bands? Right, linearly spaced. Well, two, two things that I think have it going against it versus a, a visual display that representative of what's going on with the human ear. Number one, it's linear bandwidth filters. Number two, it's block wise analysis. So your filter response is going to be based on the block size. But yeah. That's, that's a hard question. I can't, I can't give you a snappy answer. I don't know. Um, I, I think, honestly, Fourier transforms are well-known and well-studied and well-supported. And so it's probably the natural thing that we turn to to solve a problem these days. Well, it's, probably, it's been very cheap to implement. You know, the algorithms are well-known. It's not right. as computational intensive, but it doesn't necessarily match what... Well, but with that said, you can start doing things like you can group bands logarithmically, and we do that all the time. And as far as the, the block processing versus time domain, uh, we have done things like in our time stretching algorithm where we have hybrid approaches, um, sorry, I guess multi-resolution is probably the precise term, where we're using various uh, Fourier transform sizes and then mixing the results. So I agree it's not optimal, but you can at least move in that direction. And that, that does match the human ear uh, much closer. That's definitely true. Yes. By platform, do you mean Windows and Mac, or do you um, mean like Logic yeah. versus Pro Tools versus like that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's spreadsheets. Yeah. And there's checkboxes that need to be checked. And everybody's got their favorites. So just, uh, but I'm not saying what they are. Every day, crack open Pro Tools and Digital Performer and just run the process from A to Z? Yeah. And, you know, I exaggerate a little bit. Things are getting better, I think. So uh, we know these hosts pretty well at this point. So we can generally develop for one. In fact, these days, we'll probably develop for this host that you see here, which is pathetically simple, but it's enough to get our plugin UI up and it loads quickly. And the odds are that we'll encounter very few problems when we actually go to test in Pro Tools and Logic and VP and et cetera. So it, from a version one perspective, yeah. <laughs> um, when you're designing, is it you're pretty much going for this host and not so much something that's, you know, uh, I've got a big concern about looking for one that's going to be really weird when I think we can usually take problems that are specific to a host and sort of generalize them. So we'll know that uh, Pro Tools LE does not have delay compensation, and that's awful. And so what can we do about that? We can minimize the delay we introduce. And that's also true of some other hosts where delay compensation is spotty or non-existent. And so it's things like that where we know it's not like we have to start testing in Pro Tools on day one. Right. We have this short list of things that are sort of uh, – everything's trade-offs, right, in engineering. So we just have these sort of influences that are pushing us towards less system delay. And that's honestly a big one. So. Yeah. A few quick things again. Number okay. one, I just wanted to point out that you know, for anybody who hasn't seen Ozone before, that the visualizer and the scope is a lot faster than what we saw there. It's like, it's pretty accurate. I've seen it being used and it's... Oh yeah, sorry, this isn't our flashiest demo. Yeah, you must the buffer size is enormous in this thing. Uh, and uh, yeah. number two, is, uh, I was just curious if you can, what's the signal path? you know, the EQ and all that stuff, and if you can change it. Uh, yeah, this is, actually, this we haven't released this yet. This is kind of cool. We had someone work on a visualizer where you can see, if I put this EQ 
So this is the signal path and it's click the graph button. And so the EQ is first and when you switch it to stereo, it looks like that. And when you switch it to mid side, then you see the little mid on top and the side on the bottom. And that gets interesting when you're in like a multiband module that's also mid side. Am I getting signal sense in there? And then you're gonna see all four actually see what you're gonna be, see all four little mid side encoders and decoders. And so this will come up in the next update, but it is a very graphical depiction of the signal flow, and, and you can drag stuff around and change it however you want. Yeah, and then you, there's only one crossover in this product, so you can't you can't put like the EQ in the middle of the exciter and the imager. So you can only rearrange multiband modules within this larger block, which represents the crossover. And also, if you change the number of bands for one of the multiband modules, then let's see if this. No, it's not then you're going to see all three of them share the crossover, so they all have less bands. And in general, I think that's an okay constraint, just from a mastering point of view. Uh, yeah? Uh, how do you encode it, like in the actual audio bit two processor? What do you do for, for profile to, to find out that it's actually executing in the time you expect? For example, if it produces perfect output, yeah, but be really slow. it's accidentally running 10 times fast, slower than it yeah. should be. Oh, that happens a lot. Uh, there are profilers, and there are really good ones. Uh, Apple has a free one called Shark, and Intel makes one called VTune for the Windows platform. So we'll crack those open and, and use them, and they're great. They'll tell you basically each line of code, how much uh, of the overall processor time that your plugin's using, how much they're responsible for. And it's usually really easy to spot bottlenecks and say, oh, I see, okay, you know, we're doing, we have eight times more precision than we need here, so let's crank that back, or whatever. And that, that's an important step, especially now, as I mentioned, where it, optimization simply can't be ignored because we're not going to see 15 gigahertz processors next year. There's just no way. So. Uh, yeah? Um, how do you drag your products? Is there a particular way that the companies work with, you know, like RF and other products? Yeah. Yeah. We're growing, so we're trying to get better at that. It is hard. Multitasking just on anything is hard. So. We're trying to get to the point where we have separate teams. And for the most part, we do have separate projects going on, but there's always a shared bottleneck. Like, we only have one QA department that everything goes through. And so they'll be the ones who say, I'm sorry, we can't ship that this week. We need a week to finish this other thing. But as we grow, I'd imagine that we'll just try to hire independent teams that can go off and work on things, which is, must be how all the large companies do it. Ooh, we um, we do. We introduce this thing called macro presets, which uh, I don't know how many of you have seen it. This is kind of cool. There's a when you pick a preset in as, as far as we've seen for most presets and other plugins, including ours, you just have to pick. You know, you just get to choose it, and then you can use it as a starting point and go and tweak. And here we have these sliders, or I guess faders, that are connected to parameters under the hood. So if you look at this is hard to do, let's see. I can make that float and then bring it up here. So you can see if I take this flat and EQ control and turn it up, it's actually smushing the EQ, which generally softens its effect. So right from the preset window, you can click through and say, okay, you know, I like this preset, but that's too much EQ for me and you can turn it down with this control. And so preset design, I bring this up because preset design for Ozone 4 was a lot harder than it was for Ozone 3. We actually work with Dave Moulton. I don't know how many of you guys know him. Uh, great guy, local audio sort of god figure. <laughs> <laughs> we, we asked him for some help, especially showing off some of the new mid-side features we added. And so he spent a lot of time coming up with some pretty cool innovative uses of the features and then submitted those presets to us. Uh, and in general, we have, um, there's someone who works at Isotope who coordinated that, that project. And then we work with some of our beta testers too. And so usually it's it's usually a team effort for presets, and we try to get like four or five people to submit them, and then we'll go through and try to organize them and name them and stuff like that. Yes, if you click the scary advanced button, then you can, if you're brave enough, then you get flat and EQ, and you see that flat and EQ actually 
is connected to EQ gains 1, 2, 3, 4, and 8 with these ranges and a linear scale, and that's how it works. And so, you know, you can crank that up and then flatten EQ does something different. So if you want the starting point to be lower, too crazy. I agree. <laughs> but no, this is useful. It's just definitely a power user thing. It's not, you know, you're not expected to know how to do it. But I think maybe for professionals where time is money, if you have a certain workflow, and it's three clicks more than you'd like, then you might be able to create a macro preset where you say, okay, this is what I want for snare drums, and you know, if it's a slightly different setup, then maybe I want it the macro fader over here. So that's what it was designed for, and, and you can get that crazy if you want to. Oh, it's all getting better. Like, it, <laughs> no, I don't. It mostly it tends to work. I think uh, good latency count on a Mac or Windows. So the best, actually, DirectX is the best because in DirectX plugins do their own delay compensation, and so in every other plugin format you get a certain number of samples in and you need to produce that same number of samples out. So if the, the host says here's 128 samples, you have to give them 128 back and if you have system delay, then you have to give them silence and they have to deal with it. In DirectX, you can output as many samples as you want. So the way it works is that they'll give you 128 and you'll just give them zero because you don't have any real samples to output. And so you never output silence in DirectX. So I think in general that's your best bet, but that's not a common format and it's Windows only. Uh, I think Steinberg's apps these days are pretty good, actually. And that's new as of Cubase, like SX4 was the first one to get it right. And uh, other than that, Pro Tools, as you know, you need HD for it. And I think I think Logic 8 is okay, and Logic 7 was a little flaky. So, But in general, you know, ping our support department. We're always working on this. It's We, we want it to work as much as anyone. It's just not easy. So I hope that helps. Yeah. Well, fortunately, that's not our responsibility making a plugin. Um, RX was a different monster, and that was a real challenge for us because RX has an application which talks to the sound card. But the nice thing about plugins is that, in theory, you can start with a sample and you can express your inner DSP creativity, you know, quickly and easily. And all the tricky tasks like talking to the sound card are done by the DAW, the plugin host. And so. I think actually it's just uh, buffer size that matters from a plugins perspective. And we do have a time, I mean, you know, we have a lot of people at Isotope and everybody's got a different sound card. But usually we've got some of the higher end cards that can support low latencies and lots of channels and that kind of cover. And then we have some cheap, like the built-in sound card is usually a nice cheap option and that needs big buffers. And so we just try to cover that spectrum and we don't worry about hitting every manufacturer, um, at least with those ones. Yeah, UI design is a subjective thing, and as I mentioned in the talk, we struggle with that constantly. So, so when a writer is saying that you, you know, even though you improved it, it yeah. still kind of has the same look. But really, the <laughs> amount of feedback we got, some people hate it, some people love it. Okay. It's hard. So we do, we try to, I mean, we have like a brand sort of thing that we're worrying about. And so, in general, Ozone is pretty recognizable to people who do mastering, for example. And so we didn't want to alienate them and lose our brand. And so we struggled hard to make this kind of like the, you know, the new Toyota Camry sort of thing where you recognize it, but it's neat. It's cool looking. And that we're always fighting that battle. That's a challenge. You mean copy protection? Uh, yes. Okay. So like uh, like paste sort of thing? Oh, uh, no. I mean uh, as far as people stealing your software. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, if you want my take on that, we've, we've said this before. This is a pretty kind of loaded question because <laughs> everyone's passionate about it. Has anyone used paste uh, products that require an iLock? 
struggle with that. Some people hate it. Some people love it. I mean, it is convenient to have all your awesome, especially if you move from studio to studio or whatever. So it's good and bad. Um, we actually went to Pace. Piracy is awful, in the, especially in the audio industry. So we went to Pace, um, and we tried using copy protection. And this was Ozone 2, maybe? This was a long time ago. And we required uh, iLock for about a week and a half. <laughs> and, and then it was cracked. And so we had a lot of pretty angry customers that were all of a sudden requiring Pace drivers and iLock, and we had it cracked. Pace has gotten a lot better. I don't think their latest stuff has been cracked. But back then, we just, are, especially when we were smaller, like we had this core user base that we couldn't alienate like that. And so we wiped it out, and we don't really have strong copy protection. We have a serial number, but our stuff is cracked. It's not hard to find. And honestly, I don't think there's too much you can do about that without imposing some kind of burden on the user. And so we support iLock, interestingly enough, but not for copy protection. We just support it for authorization. So you can use it if you want, but you don't, you're not forced to install the face drivers. So I, I know that we get slammed from a piracy point of view, but we hope, first of all, I don't know there's, there's much of a choice. And second of all, I hope we make it up in goodwill. And you know, even if someone pirates our software, they're still using it. And that's a good thing in some way. So that's our take on it. No, the people who pirate don't fill out surveys. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it is studied. It's, <laughs> it's a, it, it is a problem, and it has been studied. There's an organization called IMSTA, I think, I-M-S-T-A, uh, and they keep stats. They're like the, I forget what it stands for, but they're the music industry sort of police, and they try really hard to make consumers aware that hey, you know, if you go and download that crack, like that's actually illegal and you shouldn't do that. And so they have some statistics, but my guess is that it's like m more pirated users than non-pirated for our stuff. And, you know, what can you do? So. Actually, this company, Able Ableton Live, as it's now they, they did something which I think is smart. They, I, I heard, I'm not sure, they, they released their own crack version. So yeah. it works for about you know a couple of months. So you make yeah. a bunch of tracks. You're all psyched. You're ready to play live. And then, boom. Yeah. And then you're like, okay, now I gotta buy this. Oh, we thought about all sorts of things because you yeah. can. I mean, you can play that game, but I, I wouldn't recommend yeah. any software developer fight the hackers because right. they have more free time than you do, and <laughs> there's more of them than there are you, and they're very smart people. So I, I don't know. We try not to fight that battle. Yeah. That's a good question. No. Yeah, there's that problem. A lot of our users don't, they have very minimal bare bones systems that they put our stuff on because they don't want them to get slow. Uh, but it is more and more interesting. The net's getting fast. I don't know if it's quite fast enough to stream uncompressed audio. It's probably not for most people, unless you've got like a big fiber optic, one of the lucky people. But uh, eventually, I think it's inevitable. It's kind of, uh, piracy goes away. As maybe that's what you're getting at. If you have, if you have to log yeah, in. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely it's like Google's kind of all over this for mail and uh, you know Google Documents and I think it's probably inevitable. But we're not. I think we're not big enough to jump on that bandwagon that early. And it's certainly not viable today. It's more like uh, you're probably seeing a lot of venture capital flowing in that direction, and it's a little bit too cutting edge. So we've thought, we certainly will discuss ideas like that internally, but we haven't committed to doing any products that are net only, at least not for this kind of audio processing stuff. Um, so I, yeah, maybe my guess is like five or 10 years and we'll see something real come there. That's just a guess. Are there any uh, feature, features that you dropped from where you're going before? You certainly added a bunch of things. But yeah, we dropped, no one's noticed yet, so I hope I don't ruin it. I, the QA gets very mad when we drop features because, like, I don't know, that's just one of the rules that they're supposed to enforce is that we don't mistakenly do that. But uh, I promise them if anyone, even a single customer asked for it, that we'd put it back. There's a auto-normalize feature. I don't know if anyone's seen this in Ozone 3. I, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't hear that. Um, I mean, this is silly. This is... If you've used normalize in a host, you know, it zips through and makes the, 
And so some, I forget, there was one major host that didn't have it for some reason, and so we added it uh, in Ozone 2, I think. And all it does is you put it in one mode, and you say, hey, figure out what the max is, and then you put it in another mode and say, hey, make that max something else by just applying gain. And every host I know of has this feature now, so it's pretty silly. So we pulled it. But there aren't many that we pulled. And that's a problem with software. I know why the QA people wanted it, though. Why is that? Because you run two signals against each other inverted, and then you got to put the... Oh, to null. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but we haven't had any users ask for it yet, so so far, so good. I think that uh, that's a problem with software. You've seen, especially some of these DAWs, they're on, like, version 15 or something. And, I mean, the number of features in these things is just unbelievable. And Ozone's guilty of this, too. If you look at Ozone 4, I mean, it's, it's a little monster. And... It's great, especially for people who knew Ozone 1, 2, and 3, and they say, oh, I want new stuff, and they can handle it. But it does get a little overwhelming, which is why we tried, for example, with these presets to make it sort of approachable. But it's tough. I think software always struggles with that, where the tendency is just to add more, 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 more. And by the time you're on version 10, it's like sometimes you end up with a monster on your hands. Uh, we don't, there, we haven't formalized that, but I think depending on the product, like in Ozone, in theory, it's supposed to be mastering, so it should be like, you know, two track, it shouldn't be on an individual track, you shouldn't have more than one Ozone open, and so we're pretty generous with what we let go on, and there's also a ton of ways to configure it to be lighter weight, but for some other products that we're working on now that are designed to be more flexible, then I think we will start imposing a CPU budget. And uh, especially now, again, as things have sort of stabilized, we kind of know how fast chips are out there. And it's not like we can just say, let's wait a year and everybody will be faster again. Okay. You may, yeah. Is, uh, is Ozone moving more to the future to like an independent thing where you can maybe do multiple tracks or fade ins and outs, more like Sonic, you know, like a Sonic Blade program or where you can export stuff? Oh, like, like Soundblade? Soundblade, sorry. Okay. Uh, I don't think so. I, it's a plug-in. That's, that's what we do is we try to focus on DSP and that making a DAW is something we certainly thought about, but it's it's probably not something that we'll ever do. So the standalone version? It's for QA. It's just a, it's a tool. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, it's not very useful. You could do better with most other hosts. For user, we could. We could add stuff like RX has some interesting features. Um, RX, we had to make an app because there are certain things that you can't do easily in a plug-in, like spectral repair, if you're uh -huh. familiar with it. But Ozone is definitely works well, and there are some, you know, if you look at some of the uh, Audition and Soundforge and Pro Tools, like, those are impressive products, and it would take us a long time just to catch up. Yeah, so I don't think that would make sense for us. In what did you use to do the DSP testing, like MATLAB or something? Sometimes algorithms will start there, but usually it's our own, it's C++ frameworks for testing DSP algorithms. Uh, usually MATLAB has some definite performance limitations for real-time stuff, and so occasionally we'll use it, but usually it's we'll write it in C++ and start using it. I think I showed this. We can write a plugin that has no UI and just gives you sliders like this. We call it an element. And so we'll start with that usually, and we can right away start processing audio or profiling to get CPU usage numbers. That's how we do it. But that depends. You know, you ask different developers, and I'm sure it's it's different for everybody. No, Agile seems to be the buzzword of the day. We get asked yeah. that a lot. Uh, I've heard that what we do is kind of like Agile, even though we don't call it that. I think it's just that the people who run projects at Isotope aren't um, schooled in any particular methodology. So I, I don't know. I, I, we probably could, and we'd do just as well. Uh, some of it seems kind of silly, but there are some pretty impressive. Uh, there are some pretty good case studies for where Agile has done a good job, for example, at managing projects. I think there's a lot of little ones. We're branching out. We just shipped a hardware product. That's a challenge. That's a big challenge for software guys. And we're, I think we did a good job with it. ANRB is a pretty high-end noise reduction box that we ship. And we're looking at more hardware products. Uh, we're looking at, we've done some work with embedded systems, but not as much as we'd like. And so we're getting into that. And so there are challenges that are tangentially related to these sort of plugins that I'm showing. 
that we're tackling. As far as uh, we're looking at TDM plugins, for example, um, Tom actually is leading that, and he's happens to be here in the audience. And uh, so I think there, there's no shortage of challenges as far as things like ozone, like ozone five or whatever you know, whatever the next big thing is. I think it's just getting harder and harder to be really innovative because there's a lot of pretty smart people out there making plugins, and we try really hard to have something that you know it, you can never be the best in every way. But we try to always have a strong angle, and that's getting difficult because there's a lot of plugins out there and a lot of DSP. So you mentioned like version one versus version four. It takes a lot of courage to put out a version one of something new, whereas doing Ozone 4 was fairly easy because we know Ozone 3 very well and it's easy to make a better one. So that's always a challenge, coming up with concepts that have the potential to be innovative in some way. But you know we're up for it and we're working on it, so. Cool. All right, thanks everybody, I appreciate it.